Hello and very warm welcome to the brand new edition of To the Point. I'm Priti Bishra, and on today's show, my guest is Chief Economic Advisor to Government of India, Mr. K. V. Subramanian. Welcome, Raj Sabha Television, and thank you so much for joining us through this virtual platform. Thanks for inviting me, Priti. So first, let's talk about the economic growth and the prospects. Of course, the Indian economy gathered pace in June with goods and movement rebounding close to pre-lockdown levels, and goods and services tax collections rising sharply from May. Are we firmly now on the recovery path, and green shoots are visible? Um, Kriti, uh, I think the green shoots are definitely visible, but um, I would still be cautiously optimistic because of um, you know the uncertainty relating to the pandemic is still on. Um, till the uncertainty you know is is taken care of uh, through a vaccine. and over the last couple of days we've heard something some very encouraging um, news um, and hopefully if we do have the vaccine by the 15th of august uh, that will be quite useful um, because what is important to understand here is that um, you know unlike the previous uh, you know previous times when there was an economic crisis whether it was the global financial crisis or the east asian crisis where these crises originated from economic factors um and and what these crises create is uncertainty for the consumer for the for the household and for the firm and what they you know what these uh, households and firms then do is to um you know get into the what is what we economists call the precautionary motive to save which is that whatever savings they have typically they'll preserve it um in anticipation that they may need it for you know uh, for for an emergency during such times uh, now in this particular case the uncertainty stemming from health factors um and therefore you know uh, there is an impact on consumption especially of discretionary items um and i think you know you and i and people common people can also relate to this which is that we for instance are not spending possibly on going on a vacation or even you know visiting malls etc those that typically are discretionary spending um you know in fact joseph stieglitz one of the foremost economists of our generation also wrote a piece a few weeks back um where he sort of um you know called into question some of the um, you know measures that have been taken by advanced economies arguing that till the uncertainty remains you know uh measures basically to try and perk up demand may not have the necessary bang for the buck uh in other words what i'm saying is that while no doubt the economic activity has come back to you know uh, to to the uh, uh levels similar to what it was last year at this point in time after the lockdown has been lifted um and there are some good you know signs especially i in i think you know in digital payments in the digital sect economy uh, in food processing because of some of the apmc reforms that are being you know undertaken um and i think agriculture itself because of the produce that is expected to be good but i think some of the discretionary items like tourism hospitality etc those will take some time and they will uh remain uh you know subdued till the uncertainty about the health uh, remains so we're ready to witness the v shaped rebound rather than u so um here you know i think it's quite pertinent to to look at past evidence um now i, I i'm sure kriti you would uh, would agree that this is a, a crisis like nothing else that any of us would have experienced during our lifetimes um and so one has to go back you know way back in history to find an episode that was of similar you know magnitudes um though um you know i and I'll, there are important differences it, i'm referring to the spanish flu pandemic of 1917 1918 um especially especially 1918 it's interesting that the r not parameter for the spanish flu was 2.3 r not by the way captures the number of individuals that an infected individual is likely to infect so for the spanish flu it was 2.3 for the covid absent any lockdowns absent any interventions has been estimated to be 2.4 which is very similar to the spanish flu and just as a contrast you know for the common flu that comes you know every year 
the R0 parameter is about 1.3. And for the Ebola pandemic, for instance, um, it's about 3.4, 3.5. In other words, from a pandemic perspective, the Spanish flu is the best proxy to the, to the COVID pandemic. Yet, I think there are important lessons there because, you know, the one third of the global population was infected uh, during the Spanish flu. Uh, now, you know, in contrast with the COVID pandemic, even though about 11 million cases are there worldwide, that still is about 0.1 percent of the population, uh, zero, about 0.15 percent. In other words, one third of the population, you know, was affected by the Spanish flu. Now it is 0.1 percent. So it's about 200 times less, you know, in terms of the, the magnitude of the infection. The rate of mortality also was about 10 percent in the case of the Spanish flu. It's about 3.4 percent globally for the COVID pandemic. So, you know, the infection is about 200 times less. The mortality rate is about one third less. And India in particular is actually having much better recovery rates, touching about 60 percent. So these are important. The reason I point these out is because despite the Spanish flu being such a greater pandemic than the COVID, the recovery then was V-shaped. And it was an economy which basically was far less connected than it was than it is today. And these kind of connectedness only actually makes it easier for the recovery to happen when the pandemic is brought under control. So it is a reasonable proxy, a far more devastating pandemic that indeed had a V-shaped economic recovery. So it's actually a reasonable, you know, uh, reasonable estimate to make that even in the case of COVID, there should be a V-shaped recovery once the health uncertainty is over. And that is a key condition that I'm actually laying out, which is if that happens, let's say, in the second half of the year, we can expect in the V-shaped recovery in the second half. But if, suppose the vaccine does not come about in the, you know, this year, then the recovery may have to actually wait for the next year. In other words, the V-shaped recovery is very critically conditioned on when do we have the vaccine and therefore we have a control on the pandemic. That's a very, very legit point that you're making. Uh, but moving on and talking about another aspect, which is uh, of the economic offensive against China. So India has stepped, uh, stepped up that offense. How do you see this war playing out in your future? So there are a couple of um, critical points that we must uh, keep in mind here. One, um, you know, independently of this, uh, the current episode and the events that are happening in the border, um, the uh, Honorable Prime Minister has given a clarion call for for us to be self-reliant and here i want to distinguish between self-reliant and self-sufficiency he's talked about self-reliance and not self-sufficiency the, the pre-91 you know import substitution that we followed was one where we basically cut ourselves from the world and isolated our, ourselves and then tried to be self-sufficient which did not go too far but self-reliance actually requires capabilities and those capabilities are not acquired, you know, in a in a vacuum. They're acquired in a competitive environment. So that is something which the prime minister has emphasized very, very clearly. Um, so we need to be building such capabilities. Now, the reason I point that out is because, you know, while I, I, I am a big advocate of, you know, of enabling markets and that markets bring prosperity, but I also do recognize, you know, and periods like the COVID pandemic, even the global financial crisis, highlight some of the limits of markets. For instance, you know, now when, when we basically needed masks and, you know, when we needed, let's say, respiratory uh, instruments, you know, the market was not able to provide and there, was short, there were shortages, which tells you that markets do work, you know, 90 to 95 percent of the time, but they don't work, you know, 100 percent of the time. So I think we have to recognize that. So in other words, we have to actually, in critical sectors, we have to have some capabilities that are actually domestically you know, built up and healthcare is certainly one of them that we have to recognize. So that's the broader narrative within which this has to be has to be seen. But at the same time, I think, you know, as as somebody who's a patriot, you know, I do recognize that, you know, and, and from an economic perspective, if you think in a game theoretic uh, fashion and, you know, economists have oftentimes used uh, game theory to try and understand these kind of political, you know, uh, geopolitical uh, aspects. I do see the role for, 
you know, for for basically us to respond as well. Um, and and you know because some of that response can also help in bringing about peace because when the other party knows that you know we have the capability to actually you know to sort of cause damage that also you know makes them wary before they think about about you know aggressive measures so from a game theoretic perspective as well there is some you know there is value in in what we are doing i think so overall from the perspective of enabling self reliance in the economy while remaining competitive and i think that is important actually you know self reliance is not about protectionism self reliance is about actually developing capabilities and remaining competitive and at the same time also demonstrating our capabilities to actually engage you know in whichever way it is optimal for us as a nation i think these are you know good steps and i think something that actually i'm encouraged by taking a cue from what you said developing capabilities you know one of the key aspects is the production of extremely important goods that could be capital intensive how do we scale up production in import dependent sectors so um you know this is something and uh, you know kriti you you would have noticed that we wrote about this in the economic survey the chapter 5 where we basically said assemble in india for the world um you know uh, one of the key learnings that comes when you look at whether india some you know the stake the automobile sector for instance um you know where we actually are you know uh, we have very good manufacturing capabilities or if you take two countries that actually over the last century have occupied about one third of the share of world exports i'm talking about japan and china when you look at the development the pa- development pattern of the automobile sector in india or the development pattern of china and japan china you know during the era of globalization and japan before globalization the common theme that emerges across all these you know automobiles in india japan and china across various sectors is that typically countries first learn to walk before they actually learn to run in other words you know metaphorically metaphorically i'm saying this uh, and what it really means concretely is you know countries learn to first assemble comp- you know assemble products they import the components actually and thereby also you know encourage technology transfer uh, you know do the assembling understand the technology and then integrate backwards in you know in being able to then manufacture these products and components as well so if you look at the data it is very very clear that countries first learn to assemble and then move backwards so when you're talking about capital equipment you know what i'm actually saying is that you know that is a journey that we need to do we need to do it sector by sector depending on the stage of development we are in for instance the automobile sector we are ready you know we actually can, you know we do have a very very well integrated sector where not only we do we assemble but we also make the products and components and the ancillaries as well so in this sector you know i think our companies should be ready to actually make you know manufacture the capital equipment that is required but if you take some of the other sectors network products actually you know let's say for instance uh, you know photographic equipment or some of the other sectors we first lead need to actually learn how to assemble them you know produce in large scale by utilizing our labor force you know importing the components assemble it thereby create lots of jobs well paying jobs and export those you know assembled components and then slowly within a few year you know few years then backward integrate into manufacturing products and comp- and components and also capital equipment so you know i think this is something which india in indian industry india inc also needs to recognize um, that there is a big opportunity you know both in sectors where the country is emphasizing on developing domestic capabilities and also in in you know in sectors where we basically feel that from the perspective of keeping our you know our, our our competitors at bay you know there are opportunities i think india inc needs to recognize this pattern of development learn from it really understand what we've conveyed in that chapter and implement that as as their business models while i'd like to agree with you on that but another important issue that i'd like to flag is that we are staring at a post covid world with diminished demand for goods what kind of additional steps do we need to spur demand 
So um, I think there are a couple of elements to your question. I guess one, you're talking about domestic demand. And secondly, maybe you're also referring to global demand. That's right. Um, so, um, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, whether it's domestic demand or global demand, uh, these have been impacted by the uncertainty. I'll give you some some research that's been done, you know, ref, I'll refer to some research that's been done for the United States. Um, at the start of the lockdown, the United States had mailed checks to many of its of their people. Um, and, you know, because the United States does not have a public distribution system like we have, where we've actually made in-kind transfers of about 60 kilograms of, of cereals per household. They don't have a system like that. So when these checks were mailed, you know, research now shows that these, uh, you know, the money that has that was given has been used primarily for essential items, spending on essential items, especially on food. But not as, you know, very little has been spent on durable items, durable, durable goods. And, and, you know, that this is basically something which again illustrates in India, if you see similarly, the PMJDY balances. Um, now, remember, the PMJDY accounts are those that are used by, by, the, by the poor, uh, accessed by the poor. Now, in the PMJDY balances as well, since the lockdown began, you know, end of March, the balances have increased by, eight, by about 18,000 crores. Now, remember, these are households that typically have a very high marginal propensity to consume. This is just jargon for saying that if a rupee is given to these, this household, very likely 95 paise out of that is like, or maybe the full rupee will be spent on consumption. In other words, they don't save that much. But even in these households where the marginal propensity to consume is so high, savings have gone up by about 450 to, five, to 500 rupees per account which also illustrates this precautionary motive to save. Even the poor households are also thinking that we need to keep some, some money for the rainy day. What this means is that the demand, therefore, for discretionary items, durable goods, you know, in the U.S., um, and it will remain actually, you know, will remain subdued till the uncertainty does not go away. And that's where this crisis is very different from the other crises, which were economic in origin, as I was mentioning earlier as well. Therefore, the efforts, global efforts that are being made to, to sort of, you know, in, to develop a vaccine are really critical in, in bringing down this uncertainty. Once the uncertainty is taken care of, people like you and me and common people feel that this is also another illness and, you know, vaccine lelia. If we take a vaccine, we are fine. We can start resuming our normal activities. You will see demand coming back in these sectors. Uh, now, in terms of global demand as well, because this affects imports and exports, Again, the uncertainty is a critical element till the time that, you know, some of the uncertainty remains, some of the service sector exports, because services is a sector that is affected a lot more by social distancing, those will remain, you know, they, they, the demand for that will remain tepid. But once the vaccine is there, you would see global demand also increasing and domestic demand increasing as well. And I think that might be the opportune moment also for us to actually think of more measures to really accelerate that demand uh, that can come there. Uh, but higher expenditure on healthcare and overall disruption in the economic activity during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, is it time to chart out a fresh glide path to bring down fiscal deficit? So, um, Kriti, extraordinary times like these, um, you know, requires us to actually think, you know, not necessarily within the template. And times like these are, you know, where, you know, are times where I would not worry as much about the fiscal deficit. You know, we, our, you know, our, our um, analysis also shows that even when you think about debt sustainability, and finally, you worry about the fiscal deficit only because you care about debt sustainability. Because, you know, and it's sort of, I'm going to use a technical term here. Debt is the stock of, is a stock measure and deficit is a flow measure. So, you know, when you take on more and more debt, that accumulates the debt. So it's a stock. Um, reason we worry about fiscal deficit is because eventually we worry about, about debt and debt sustainability. And, and the, uh, what our analysis clearly shows is that growth is what is the most important for debt sustainability in the Indian, you know, Indian scenario. So whenever we've had high growth, 
you know debt has become sustainable because it's it's the denominator the debt to gdp ratios have become more sustainable so in times like these you know we really have to focus on growth but at the same time also recognize you know that the the growth is dependent on demand across various sectors which itself depends on uncertainty you know being sort of been taken care of and the precautionary motive to save going away and people re- resuming normal operations in other words to summarize what i'm saying is there is no doubt that we have to focus on growth but you know the timing of the demand push is very critical here because if we you know as joseph stiglitz has also been you know arguing and i have independently been you know making the case as well that with the uncertainty remaining you know the timing may not be quite right but once the uncertainty is over that's when the bang for the buck may be very high in you know in doing a demand push and thereby accelerating growth and bringing debt sustainability as well in the process all uh, right shifting focus to startups now you know you've staunchly corroborated the idea of startups leading the way your analogy in this year's economic survey with a bollywood protagonist is deeply edged in my mind at least what does covid-19 crisis mean for indian startup funding ecosystem in 2020 so i think you know for the startups um the opportunities are enormous um if there are sectors you know um that are that are getting let's say negatively impacted um the startups would be an area that would certainly get positively impacted because you know whenever there is a disruption like the one that covid you know brings um that leads to creative destruction and startups play a key key role in that process of creative destruction um you know for instance a few few months back we might have been having this this conversation you know in your studio um or maybe in my office um while we're having this discussion now online and at the same time maintaining social distancing i don't think we would have basically thought about this you know maybe february we wouldn't have even considered something like this um or for that matter you know doing a lot of webinars that are happening um you know the, the fin the role of fintech there are just so many opportunities even some of the sectors where you know some of the international startups are being you know that the sort of space for that is being uh, reduced for strategic reasons you know there are domestic startups have enormous opportunity to go and fill that that void um and so overall i think this is a wonderful time for a lot of ideas to come in so i would really encourage the startup com- community to go back to the drawing board think about you know all the areas in which covid actually creates opportunities and really burn the midnight oil to come up with solutions because this is an opportunity like none other for startups to be able to really make their presence felt um you know in this case um i think the other part which you are uh, you know asked which is on the funding bit um yes that that is also something that is quite critical you know my my experience and actually i've done uh, some of my early research was in venture capital and what i've seen is when there is you know when there are high quality ideas funding comes in as well the source of that funding may not be country x may instead be coming from country y or maybe from you know from maybe venture capital x versus venture capital y or maybe an angel investor x or angel investor y but you know they do come in so my exhortation to the startup community would be focus on the quality of ideas you know let's try and build build the facebooks the the equivalent of that some of those breakthrough ideas and then funding will definitely come in lastly you underscored the need for pro business policies judicious and limited government intervention in markets with thrust on exports for employment generation do you think the measures recently announced by the government pave way for these objectives I certainly think so. Um in fact, you know, if we look at the packages that have been announced by various countries across the globe, um India stands out as the exception in including a slew of reforms, you know, as part of its COVID stimulus package. India is is really the exception. No other country has come up with reforms as part of its COVID package. Now, you know, which are the elements of reforms that are quite important and sort of fit the theme of less government intervention and enabling more 
private sector participation thereby efficiency i'll mark out there are many i'll 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 mark out a few firstly for me you know i think the agriculture sector reforms are really really critical they are path breaking uh, you know these the uh, restrictions that were imposed by apmc act while we may think that this is something that has been there for decades but in various ways these kind of restrictions have remained till the since the time of alauddin khilji in other words we're not talking about actually you know decades we're talking about centuries where the indian farmer has not had the freedom to go and sell his produce you know where whichever place he wanted to or even actually being able to store the produce to be able to decide saying oh no i don't want to sell this month maybe i want to sell it couple of months later when maybe the glut of supply is not there and so i might get a better produce i'm talking about storage basically the essential commodities act for instance treated all storage and holding as as the same there was no distinction made between storage and holding as a result food processing sectors could not come up now because of the apmc reforms that we've undertaken the indian farmer has the opportunity to go and sell where he wants um he can store and create storage infrastructure because of the changes that we brought to the essential commodities act um and the food processing sectors can really go up now uh, and in fact many of these may be export intensive as well because there are many indian you know um uh, sort of food products that have global demand and so this is really that's one set of re- reforms these are product market reforms where we've, where we've removed the restrictions in other words we basically have the government intervention that was restricting the farmer's choice you know to 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 sell where he wants store what he wants and basically do what he wants in terms of his produce those have been removed that's first example the second i would point out is the policy on privatization that has been announced um i think here as well it is important to keep in mind the history you know in the 1950s when the uh, industrial policy then was announced and this was under the socialist regime the commanding heights of the economy were given to the public sector now even even 3 almost 3 decades after liberalization you know we were not using the word privatization in our you know in the government language you know this year's economic survey went ahead and used the word privatization and and said talked about privatization and wealth creation and showed how privatization you know creates wealth um now the policy that has been announced as part of the atmanirbhar bharat package um, says that there will be in all non strategic sectors you know the uh, uh, government owned enterprises will basically you know will will make an exit in strategic sectors it will be limited to about to four you know soe state owned enterprises or pos psus so what the government has done is actually you know sort of put a full stop to this this policy that was you know started in the 1950s about providing the commanding heights of the economy to the public sector effectively through this policy now the government has given the commanding heights of the economy to the private sector recognizing the efficiency they bring and that is again another example of you know removing government intervention and government not being in those businesses where it has no business to be in that business um so this is a second set of reforms third is some of the factor market reforms you know on the on the labor side um the you know, both the union government and several state governments are pushing on this which will also enable you know job creation in the formal sector you know our, our labor force a large proportion of our labor force about 89% is in the informal sector this will enable you know lot more job creation in the formal sector and will bring in investment as well so these are just three examples i'm giving of some of the ideas of basically enabling more private sector participation and reducing government you know intervention in in the in the economy which i think i'm really glad to see being fructified in the policies that have been announced now as part of the atmanirbhar bharat absolutely mr subramanian you gave us perspective on host of issues thank you so much for joining us and speaking to us in this era of social distancing through this virtual platform thanks for speaking to us about that vision thank you very much priti for inviting me 